Dictionary.com defines comeback as a return to a former higher rank or prosperity. However, the way I would define a comeback is Devil May Cry 3. After Devil May Cry 2, the series had to do something big and fast, and man did they ever. Devil May Cry 3 saved the franchise, there's no other way to put it. Everything that the last game did wrong, this game did right and then some. And while it's not a perfect game, it comes pretty dang close at points. You get the idea, let's talk about Devil May Cry 3. Devil May Cry. We're back to the Devil May Cry 1 style of combat, and it's great. Timing your melee attacks to produce different combos and having different weapons with different styles of attacks, it's here and it feels great. The controls are the same as the previous games, with one exception, that being the B button. In the first game, the B button was just another button to fire your guns, and in the second game, it was sort of a dodge button. In this game, the B button is used for the style system. The style system is, in my opinion, the biggest innovation in Devil May Cry 3. You can select from four different styles in between missions, but you can only use one style during the mission. Depending on the style you have, this changes what the B button does. The first style is Trickster. This gives you a more effective dodge move. Gunslinger gives you more options when using your guns. Then there's Royal Guard. This is a block move that absorbs enemy attacks and allows you to send it back to them using the Royal Guard release. Swordmaster unlocks more melee moves and allows you to attack enemies while in the air. Each of these styles can be upgraded the more you use them throughout the game, but again, you can only have one equipped at a time. You get two more styles later on in the game. Doppelganger, which allows you to make a clone of yourself that imitates your movements. Finally, there is Quicksilver. This style slows down time, allowing Dante to run circles around the enemies. The styles allow the player to choose how they want to play, which is great, it adds way more variety to the game. Not only that, but the weapons also add a new layer of variety. The weapons are better than ever in this game, with a total of 5 melee and ranged weapons. Each weapon feels distinct and different from each other. For starters, you get the Main Sword Rebellion, which functions exactly like it did in Devil May Cry 1, with a few new moves for safe measure. Cerberus which are ice nunchucks that can hit the enemy with a bunch of fast spinning attacks. Acne and Rudra, dual swords that seem to use ice and fire to attack the enemies. Side note, these are my favorite weapons in the game. Nevin, which is... um... An electric guitar that creates bats. Okay then. Finally there is Beowulf, which is an evolved version of Ifrit from the first game. Although, like Rebellion, it has some new moves to spice things up. With the amount of weapons in this game, combat goes to a whole new level. The only problem with this combat is that you can only equip two weapons at a time. But that's more of a nitpick than anything. Of course, guns are still here, but in this game, they are really just for chip damage, even more than the first game, because at least in that game, the shotgun was a bit overpowered in the beginning. In this game, none of the guns are exactly that useful, except maybe the rocket launcher, which in this game is called the Kalina Ann. More on that name later. But it's not really worth going into depth with the guns, because again, more so in this game than the last game, they're not all that useful. Moving on to the bosses. And out of the gate, this game has the best group of bosses so far in the series. Some aren't as great as others, but the great ones are really, really great. For starters, there's Cerberus, a three-headed ice dog. 
he has hard to dodge attacks and requires to break the ice on his head and his paws in order to start doing damage. Cerberus is a really fun fight and is a really good starting point for the game. There is also Agni and Rudra, two giants that will charge at you and do slash attacks with their swords. I was actually surprised at how fun this fight is. I normally hate bosses where there are multiple enemies, but this was a lot of fun. One important thing to note is in this fight that you need to do equal damage to both bosses or else when you defeat one of them, the other one will get a massive power boost. But still, really fun. Another notable boss is Beowulf, a giant walking dog looking thing who's a straight up brawler. He hits hard and fast. For this fight, I recommend hit and run tactics. Then there's Nevin. Honestly, not a huge fan of this boss. She's one of the few bosses in Devil May Cry in general, I believe, where you can recognize patterns of the boss. And again, just not a huge fan of this boss. By defeating each of these bosses, you gain the various weapons mentioned earlier, which is a great reward for defeating the boss. Other bosses aren't that great, but again, a vast majority of them are good. But, don't you think for a second that I forgot about Virgil. Virgil is not only the main antagonist of the game, but he is also the best boss of the entire game. You fight him three times, and all three of his fights are amazing. The first fight is a true test of your early skills in the game. The second fight ups the difficulty considerably, especially with Virgil using Beowulf, before you take it back from him, of course. Then, there's the third fight, which may be the hardest battle in the whole series, but dang, is it awesome. This fight also has the biggest stakes emotionally in the entire series, but we'll get more into that in the story section. Now that we've talked about the boss fights, let's move on to more general gameplay changes. Like Devil Trigger. It's been changed up in this game. It's not as powerful as it was in the previous two games, but it definitely helps in combat. In this game, you move much faster in Devil Trigger mode, your health regenerates, and you do a bit more damage, like the other games. But, one new feature of Devil Trigger is called Devil Trigger Explosion. Hold down the Devil Trigger button, and you'll start to see your meter charging. When you let go of the button, a small explosion will happen, damaging any enemy that's around you. It's a cool ability, and I find that it really helps against these chessboard-looking enemies. Another new thing that really stands out in this game is the new style meter. This little meter on the side of the screen adds a new layer to the combat. In the previous games, all that mattered was just how quickly you killed the enemy. But in this game, you're encouraged to use different attacks to keep the meter going up to that coveted triple S rank. Not to mention, the better you do on your style meter, the more red orbs you get from the defeated enemies, allowing you to upgrade more abilities. All these additions make combat vastly superior to the two previous games. The level design takes a step back though. It goes back to the Devil May Cry 1 style of levels, where you go through and find a bunch of stuff to help you progress. I'll go more into detail later about my thoughts on this, but that's the basics of it. Now with all that out of the way, it's time to talk about the story. Skip to this point here if you want to avoid spoilers. Now, let's do this. Unlike the previous two games, there's actually a story here that's worth going in-depth about. So let's do just that. The story follows a young Dante, who is just starting out his demon hunting career. In fact, he hasn't even picked out a name for his shop. While sitting in his unnamed shop, a mysterious man named Arkham walks in claiming to be sent by Dante's brother Virgil, who Dante hasn't seen for a whole year. Arkham then disappears and summons a bunch of demons to attack Dante. And then, one of the greatest moments in gaming history happens. <laughs> Yeah. 
If you thought the first game was over the top, you ain't seen nothing yet. Now, after a battle in Dante's shop and a fight in the street, a tower pops out of the ground, and at the top of the tower is Virgil. And well... Virgil's so freaking cool, you guys. It's revealed here that Virgil wants the amulet that's around Dante's neck in order to open a portal to the demon realm. Dante makes his way inside the tower and defeats Cerberus when a certain female comes inside the tower. Have I mentioned how amazing the cutscenes are in this game? Because they're fantastic. Eventually we will learn that Arkham is this girl's father. However, Lady, aka her, wants to kill Arkham. You might be wondering why. Well that's because Arkham sacrificed his wife, aka her mom, in order to gain demonic power. Eventually, Dante meets up with Virgil, and it doesn't go great. Virgil takes Dante's half of the amulet that they both share, then they walk away, leaving Dante bleeding on the ground. Oh, don't worry, he's fine. Later on, Virgil betrays Arkham, saying he no longer needs him. Fast forward when Lady discovers her father, lying on the floor bleeding, and Arkham convinces Lady that he was being controlled by Virgil. Speaking of Virgil, he's reached the ritual spot to open the demon world, but before he can complete the ritual, Dante shows up and they have a second battle. Lady also shows up and starts fighting them, but then Arkham shows up and takes them all down as they're weakened. Then Arkham completes the ritual, and this happens. Just sit and wait. Wait for the birth of a new god. I shall take over the power of Sparta! Now Dante and Lady must climb back up the tower to catch Arkham. Eventually, they meet back up and Dante and Lady have a heart to heart. I'll take care of him. Why do you care so much? This whole business started with my father, sealing the entrance between the two worlds. And now, my brother's trying to break that spell and turn everything into Demonville. This is my family matter, too. Quite frankly, at first, I didn't give a But because of you, I know what's important now. I know what I need to do. Wait! Trust me, I'll make things right for you. That's what my soul is telling me to do. Use this. How much is it gonna cost me? You can give me your name. Dante. Dante. Free my father. I will, lady. By the way, that rocket launcher is named after Lady's mom, and that's why it's called the Kalina Anne. Finally, Dante catches up to Arkham and he turns into this. Oh. 
oh, I've got things to say about this later. But no time to talk because Virgil is back, and together, him and Dante defeat Arkham. But Arkham isn't dead just yet. He crawls to the top of the tower, where Lady is waiting for him. Mary died a long time ago. My name is Lady. Goodbye, Father. <gasps> no! After that, Dante and Virgil have one final showdown, which ends in the defeat of Virgil. Remember how I said this fight had the biggest emotional stakes? Well, let me explain. Dante realizes what he has to do. He has to save the world, but he also realizes that in order to do that, he has to kill his brother. And that sucks, because they may be rivals, and they may have their differences, but in the end, they're still family. Then after that, well, why don't I just let Lady explain what happened next? What happened next? Nothing, really. We took care of all the remaining devils, and that was it. I still have a job to do that's far from done, which is to eliminate every last demon. I need to ensure that monsters like my father never come about again. And he promised to help me hunt down the demons, even though he's part one himself. But now I realize that there are humans as evil as any devil, as well as kind and compassionate demons in this universe. At least I've found one so-called devil who is able to shed tears for those he cares about. That's enough for me to believe in him. Now I can start my business. Oh, speaking of a kind devil, he finally decided on a name for his shop. It took him quite a while to pick one. Wanna know the name? Devil May Cry. Overall, the story is really fun, and is a monumental improvement over the previous two games. Large portion of the improvement, at least in my opinion, results from the brand new voiced cast. Specifically, Ruben Langdon as Dante, Dan Southworth as Virgil, and Carrie Walgren as Lady. Ruben brings an energy to Dante unlike anyone else, making every line that comes from his mouth seem genuinely awesome. I don't think I'm alone on this thought either, as Ruben has gone on to voice Dante in every official piece of Devil May Cry media since. Then, there's Dan Southworth, who before playing this game, I knew as the Quantum Ranger on Power Rangers Time Force. But now, I know him for having one of the coolest voices ever. Does that woman really bother you? Why didn't you kill her? Perhaps because she's your daughter? Did some pesky fatherly love get in your way? Virgil brings such an intensity to this game that the other villains could only dream of bringing, even compared to Arkham. Again, we'll get to my thoughts on Arkham later. But yeah, Virgil is awesome. However, you can't talk about the men of Devil May Cry without talking about the lady of Devil May Cry. Lady is one of my favorite females in video games, period. She kicks butt like no one else and easily has the most emotional baggage with the story. Her journey of revenge against Arkham is a really compelling one, and Carrie Walgren pulls off the character amazingly and is easily my favorite voice for Lady. I think you get the point. Devil May Cry 3 finally gave us a good story. However, it's not perfect. I'm mainly talking about Arkham. I don't hate him, but compared to Virgil, Arkham just isn't as good of a villain to me. The main thing that makes Arkham interesting is his relationship with Lady, but other than that, I find him a bit bland. But, I'll take Arkham any day over... <sighs> Jester. I don't like Jester. I really don't. I find him really annoying. Which might have been the point, I don't know, but that still doesn't change the fact that I don't like him. In my opinion, he doesn't fit with the game tonally. Yes, the game has its over-the-top moments, but Jester just feels, well, stupid. Jester isn't the only thing I don't like in the game. For example... Remember how I said the level design goes back to the Devil May Cry 1 style of gameplay? Well, on paper, this doesn't sound like a bad idea, but the execution is flawed. 
In Devil May Cry 1, it was fairly straightforward because the levels weren't all that big. In Devil May Cry 3, on the other hand, levels are much bigger, making it much easier to get lost. Not gonna lie, I had to look up where to go at points because it's that easy to get lost in these levels. Another thing to talk about are the bosses. I talked about a lot of them earlier on in the video, but I neglected to mention two of them, because I'm gonna talk about them now. Jester and Arkham. In my opinion, these are the two worst fights in the game. Jester is just a bunch of dodging until he lets you hit him. Not to mention, he's really easy compared to the other bosses in the game, in my opinion at least. So overall, I don't like this boss. Still much better than Arkham though. Arkham is easily the worst boss in the game. For one, I hate the design. Second of all, this fight changes the controls and not in a good way. In the second phase of the battle, Virgil joins in on the fight. Awesome, right? Wrong. In this phase, Virgil will copy your every move in battle, and you can press the B button in order to summon Virgil to your side. The problem with this is that this replaces your style move, so any move you learn with your style is now gone with this fight. Also, you can't use Devil Trigger in this phase of the fight, which makes no sense whatsoever. These fights stand out even more when compared to the high standards set by other bosses in the game. Now the last thing I don't like in this game is that it still contains the automatic camera change of Devil May Cry 1. Now while it isn't as bad as it was in Devil May Cry 1, it's still here and it's still annoying. And that's about all I don't like in this game. And believe me, the good things far surpass the bad things in this game. The combat truly surpasses the last two games by miles. The story here is something truly special, being an awesome blend of pure over-the-top action and some genuine moments of heart, once again carried by some truly stellar voice and mocap acting. This game also introduced some brand new modes to the series, such as the Heaven or Hell difficulty, in which every enemy dies in one hit, but you, aka the player, also die in one hit. There's also something else, but I can't remember what it is. I need a hint. Did y'all really think I was going to forget about Virgil? Yes, that's right. After beating the story as Dante, you unlock the ability to play through the whole story as Virgil. Unfortunately, he only gets one new cutscene, and all the levels are the exact same, but his gameplay is completely different. Virgil has three weapons, his Katana Yamato, Beowulf, which Dante also used, and Force Edge, which is Virgil's version of Dante's Sword Rebellion. I'll discuss Virgil more in Devil May Cry 4, since they expand on his gameplay way more in that game, but for this game, I will say that the coolest part is that I believe you can do everything that Virgil could do when you fought against him as a boss. I say I believe, because I have yet to master Virgil. I think you get it. This game is fantastic, and is easily the best out of the first three Devil May Cry games. Now, I would recommend playing the... HD collection version, as not only does it come with the first game, but it also comes with... Looks like it's your lucky day. The other one. It's also the most updated version of this game. It's not particularly hard to find either. There's a version for the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360, and also for PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. I think you get my point. Now go out and play Devil May Cry 3 Special Edition, and have a great time. Trust me, it's going to be a blast. But, we still got two more stops before we're done with this marathon. So join me next time as I take a look at Devil May Cry 4.